So welcome back to module number 13 of unit three, biological basis of behavior. We're gonna be going over some information about brain hemisphere organization and the biology of consciousness. And talking a little bit about some of the history of what we know about um, the different brain hemispheres and how we came to understand the different functioning of each hemisphere. So the learning targets for today are to be able to explain what split brains reveal about the functions of our two hemispheres and to be able to discuss the dual processing being revealed by today's cognitive neuroscience and such a fascinating field to go into cognitive neuroscience. Um, I had the opportunity to work at a neuroscience research center at Georgetown University uh, prior to completing my PhD in school psychology. And it was fascinating stuff to be a part of research looking at the functional magnetic resident imaging results from individuals with dyslexia, autism, hyperlexia, which is uh, kids who have really good readers early on and versus those who are struggling to read those with dyslexia. So what is meant by a split brain? When you see that blue arrow right there, that is pointing to the corpus callosum, which is a wide band of axon fibers connecting the two hemispheres of the brain. So split brain results when the fibers of those corpus callosum are severed. Um, and then that isolates each hemisphere of the brain from the other. Okay. So we've known for about over a hundred years that the two sides of the brain have some different purposes and that we kind of knew that damage to the left side resulted in problems with reading, writing, speaking, math, and reasoning. And for a long time, people really didn't understand that the right hemisphere was also responsible for many things. Until around 1960, when it was discovered that the right hemisphere had some specialties as well which we're gonna to get to how that happened that we, under, we happened to learn about that. So how are the eyes wired to the brain? Um, in each information, in each eye, information from the left visual field goes to your right eye, to your right hemisphere, sorry, and information from the right half of your visual field goes to your left hemisphere. So I'll give you a second to look at this image to see how the right visual field, where it goes to and where the left visual field goes to. So what is a visual field? Along the retina of the eye, sense receptors pick up stimuli that is about two inches apart. The right sides of both retinas gather information from the left side of what you're looking at and vice versa. Again, take a good look at that image there so you can kind of understand what's going on. So how is a split brain different than an intact brain? So in an individual with an intact brain, information is sort of readily transferred across that corpus callosum. So it can go from one hemisphere to the other hemisphere. In an individual with a split brain, someone who has had their corpus callosum most likely severed, or it could happen in some other natural way, um, this cross transference does not occur. Researchers are able to send information to one hemisphere and test the patients, which is exactly what some researchers did. Um, uh, the, one of the first and most interesting studies in this area was by Michael Gazinaga, who studied the split brains of patients. And here's a little bit about, a little overview of the study that he did, one of the initial studies that he did. And we're gonna review it sort of um, step by step over the next few slides. So the first step was that patients with a severed corpus callosum, those split brain patients, were asked to look at a dot in the center of a screen. This created a left and right visual field. So the word heart, for example, was flashed on the screen so that the word he was in the left visual field and the word art appeared in the right visual field. Then patients were asked to tell Kazinaga what they had seen. Patients reported seeing the word art. So let's think about, due to the brain's cross wiring, objects in the right visual field are perceived in the left hemisphere. So what does the left hemisphere do? It contains two association areas that are really important, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. They're both involved in language. With Broca's area, um, when it gets damaged, people have, um, difficulties with 
expressive language, but their receptive language, their understanding remains intact. And with damage to Wernicke's area, um, individuals have um, impaired receptive language, but their, their expressive language remains intact. So let's look at this again. The patient with the split brain saw art in the right visual field. This information was processed in the left hemisphere and the left hemisphere controls the language. So the patient said art when they were asked what word did they see. But there's more. Due to the brain's cross wiring, the left hand, which is controlled by the right hemisphere, pointed to the word flashed in the left visual field. So when they were asked, point with your left hand to the word you saw, they would point to he. So what would you answer? A split brain patient has a picture of a dog flashed to his right hemisphere and a cat to his left hemisphere. He will likely be able to identify the, of all these, which would be the best choice? A, cat, using his right hand. So what are a few differences between the left and right hemisphere? And I'm gonna keep saying this over and over again throughout the rest of these slides that we aren't right-brained or left-brained, that's a bit of a psychomyth, and our two brain hemispheres work together. But in most people, the left hemisphere seems to control speaking and language, math calculations, making literal interpretations, and controlling the right side of the body. Whereas the right hemisphere in most people is more responsible for perceptual tasks, making inferences as opposed to those literal interpretations, modulating speech and visual perception, recognition of emotion, a really important one, and controlling the left side of the body. So a point to note, humans do not have two brains. We have one brain with two distinct yet coordinated hemispheres. And while we're at it, let's make sure that we know that we are not right-brained or left-brained, no matter what you've read or what tests you've taken on Facebook or some other social media site. We are not right-brained or left-brained. There's a really good TED-Ed, if you're interested, I think it's TED-Ed, um, about um, how we are not right-brained or left-brained. We use our entire brain to perform countless activities in an integrated manner. So we have a left and a right hemisphere, but we use our entire brain. We're not one brain versus another brain. So how would you answer this? Which of the following is most likely to be a function of the left hemisphere? So hopefully you remember back the past few slides that I said, that I talked about, and you would say, A, speech seems to be the most likely of all those for most people. Okay, so here's an AP exam tip. The classic split brain studies that I just went over, the Gazinaga studies that are often, I think they're within the 40 studies that change psychology book as well, if you wanna dive more deeply into them, or there's YouTube videos that uh, have some really interesting clips about some of the split brain studies. Um, this is likely to show up on the AP exam if you plan to take it. And notice that if you're reading the textbook, your authors are never referring to your left brain or your right brain. You have two brain hemispheres, each with its own responsibilities, but you have one brain. And often in the media, we're misled to believe this whole idea, this myth about being left brained or right brained happens very frequently. So when you're studying for the AP exam or just in general, try to stay away from this myth and others. So how do cognitive neuroscientists study consciousness? What is consciousness? Our subjective awareness of ourselves and our environment. So today's science explores the biology of consciousness, our, the biology of our subjective awareness of ourselves and others. The question of how consciousness arises from the brain is generally still a mystery, but there's more and more being learned all the time in this area, cutting edge research. So, Cognitive uh, neuroscience combines the study of brain activity with how we learn, think, remember, and perceive. Researchers are exploring and mapping out the conscious functions of the cortex. So what is the idea of dual processing? The principle that information is often simultaneously processed on separate con conscious and unconscious tracks, the two-track mind. So. The per so perception, memory, thinking, and attitudes all operate on two levels, two different levels. We've got a conscious, deliberate high road and an unconscious, automatic low road. The high road is reflective and the low road is intuitive. You may have read um, 
Daniel Kahneman is a really a prominent economist who writes a lot about this, and he has some wonderful um, YouTube videos describing his, um, his ideas in this area. So what is blind sight? A really fascinating concept, um, a term to know, a condition in which a person can respond to a visual stimulus without consciously experiencing it. So how would you answer this question? The dual processing model refers to which of the following ideas? So dual processing, what I just talked about, it's the idea that B, incoming information is processed by both conscious and unconscious tracks. And I apologize if you hear my dogs a little bit in the background. <laughs> okay, what is the difference between parallel and sequential processing? This is really interesting. Parallel processing, is the unconscious processing of many aspects of a problem simultaneously. So parallel processing is generally used to process well-learned information, things we already know how to do really well, um, are processed in a sort of parallel, parallel way. So it enables your mind to take care of sort of routine business, whereas sequential processing is best for solving new problems, which require our focused attention on one thing at a time. Okay, generally used to process new information or to solve difficult problems. You can sort of test this out a little bit. So say if you're right-handed, move your right foot in a smooth counterclockwise circle and write the number three repeatedly with your right hand at the same time. And then try something, uh, you know, like tapping a steady beat three times with your left hand while tapping four times with your right hand. All these new things that you'd be doing can, can um, would sort of activate your sequential processing uh system that both tasks would require conscious attention, which can only be at one place at one time. So that's a little bit of the difference between the parallel processing, which is that unconscious processing of many aspects of a problem simultaneously versus the conscious processing. When you're learning something new, it has to be sequential, sort of step by step by step. Um, and it's usually used to solve difficult problems. So what is Let's go back to those learning targets. What was the first one? Explain what split brains reveal about the functions of our two hemispheres. Well, first and foremost, we're not right brain or left brain, right? We learned that. Um, split brain research experiments on people that have a severed corpus callosum have confirmed that in most people, the left hemisphere, in most people, remember that part, not every single person, in most people, the left hemisphere is more verbal and the right hemisphere excels in visual perception and the recognition of emotion. And then how about the idea of dual processing? What did we learn about that? Um, so cognitive neuroscientists have discovered that the mind processes information on these two separate tracks, sort of this dual processing that affects our perception, memory, attitudes, and cognitions. And then there's also parallel versus sequential processing with the parallel processing helping us for things, our routine business, things we know how to do well, while sequential processing provides the focus we need to solve new problems. And that is it for module number 13. Thank you so much for 